Good afternoon. Welcome to week five. Yes, five. Um, we are going to be, we're done with database design per se. This topic today kind of overlaps between, yes. Yes, I'll do it after this. I just want to make sure I cover the material and then I'll do the example. So the topic this week is indexes and views. It's a topic that kind of overlaps between um, the design aspects of database administration and um, actual physical implementation. It's kind of, a, there's a reason why we do two topics in one lecture is that both of them are fairly straightforward topics unless you want to get into really uh, nitty gritty details. Um, as always, there's uh, there's many layers of complexity, but we're just covering the basics of it because I'll be honest, I've been working in database industry for 26 years and the basics is all I've ever needed. I just need to know what it does. I don't need to understand the magical math happening inside the database server to make it work. Uh, it'll be pretty much the same for you guys. Okay, so indexes. We're gonna talk about what they're for, um, how they work, some basic rules and a couple of examples. And I'm also gonna talk about views, uh, the different styles of views and a couple of examples for that. So starting off with indexes. So the purpose of an index, most queries only ever need a small amount of data. Usually when you do a query against a database, you're searching something specific or a specific set of records and you're pulling them out. Now, Imagine that if the only way to search through the entire database was to literally do a complete what they call table scan. What a table scan means is, well, you guys remember a where clause, right? Where, you know, select star from whatever, where, and you got some criteria. Imagine that the only way it could find the data would be row one, does it match? Yes, no. Row two, does it match? Yes, no. Row three, four, row 10 million. 11 million you know, 50 million. And it has to scan every table. Then you do a join. It's got to scan the other entire table and then go, hey, by the way, do they, while we're scanning this, they match up. Um, it's not very efficient. The purpose of an index is to help speed up the queries so that we don't have to search the entire database. My favorite example, real world experience that some of you may have had I've noticed that the younger ones nowadays don't seem to have this experience as much. When was the last time one of you went to a library and couldn't find something and you ended up asking a librarian? One, two, great, three. So most of you have never actually asked a librarian for help. Those of us that remember going to the library and trying to find stuff, especially those of us of a certain vintage before they even had computers in the library to help you find stuff, you used to have to go look stuff up in a card file and you never find it. Uh, if anybody's experienced the Ottawa Public Library with their fantastic uh, index system where you can still never find anything even though it's completely computerized, the fastest way to find a topic in a library, a books on the topic you want in a library is to walk up to the library and say, hey, I'm trying to find books about this topic. She'll ask you a couple of questions, he or she, will ask you a couple of questions. And then I've had the experience where they literally walked up to a shelf and grabbed a book and gave it to me. They didn't even tell me where to go look for it. They literally grabbed the book I needed off the shelf and handed it to me. That's basically what an index does inside the database. It basically optimizes searches in such a way that when you ask, it knows where to go find the records in the table without having to read the whole table. It, it knows, it's a map. So another analogy, which most of you may have experienced more likely, is you know the index at the end of the textbook? And, tells you to go to this page, same thing. And surprisingly, it's called an index, just like it's called an index in the database. I wonder if you got the idea to call it an index in the database, because obviously books are around for databases. Um, so the definition of an index is, it's a data structure that's used to speed up data retrieval. It usually contains a list of keys used to identify columns in a table. So it's a data structure. What's cool about an index is 
you can't actually see the contents of the index. You you can look at the contents of a table, no problem. You've all experienced that. You know, select star from customers. Bam. You can see what's inside the customer's table. But you can't see what's inside the index. You can see that the index exists, especially if you're using a GUI tool like MySQL Workbench or phpMyAdmin or something of that nature. You can see that the index exists. You can see how it's defined. Sometimes you can even get some statistics on it and how efficient it is and that kind of stuff. When you create a table, with a primary key, the primary key is always indexed by default. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. Indexes are always indexed. Other fields and combination of fields can also be indexed. Uh, these are known as secondary keys uh, or non-unique keys. Um, here's a pro tip. Foreign keys are not indexed by default. Um, believe it or not, that's something I didn't know till about 12 years ago where we had a series of uh, calls to a database that suddenly slowed down for unknown reasons. Till I went digging and I realized there was no indexes on any of the foreign keys. Queries that were taking four minutes to run after I created the indexes were running in about a half a second. It was that much of an improvement just because I added, you know, I spent 10 minutes creating foreign uh, indexes on the foreign keys. So, Let's just say we got a column called name in our table. The way it's organized, the most common index type is known as a B plus tree. And the way it works is it takes the values, divides them in half, then takes those values, divides them in half, takes that set of values, divides them in half. It can go four layers deep. And if there's a lot of values, it'll actually go quite wide this way with the breakdown. Um, sometimes they won't divide it in half. It might divide it in four and then take that four and divide it in four depending on just how much data it is. Um, this is also a cool thing. I didn't, uh, for years I thought B-tree stood for binary tree. And I had literally had a um, data scientist with a PhD who actually wrote code for indexes come to me and say, yeah, it's not called a binary tree. It's a best tree. Literally, B tree stands for best tree. Yeah, but it annoys. Um, so B trees are the most common index in engine. Basically, MySQL, that's all it uses. Other database engines will offer you other styles of indexes. Uh, for example, Postgres has four kinds of indexes. Um, more, the most used one, again, is the B tree. If not, it uses an H tree, which stands for heuristic tree. Uh, it actually applies logic on how it breaks down the data. Uh, and it's got two other kinds that almost nobody uses. All right, to give you a better idea of how the tree works, let's just say we have an index, and it's also on name of, this one's the name of uh, sports teams. and the first layer might be divided as F, P, and Z. Under that, it'll break down B to F, H to P, R to Z, because that's literally the values we have. And then after that, you'll actually have the separate uh, values stored in each of those ranges. So for example, we're trying to find the flyers. It'll look at the first index saying, hey, is the first letter earlier than F or equal to F, it goes, yes. Okay, we're going to drop into the first branch. Then it'll go B, D, and F. Is it before B? No. Is it before D? No. Is it before F or equal to F? Yes. Okay, well, we'll drop down into the Fs and find it in there. It's significantly faster to step through the index quickly through different layers than scanning the entire table because it'll tell you where it is. Now, a few other things that are cool about how indexes work. What they store is not actually the values. It stores a fingerprint of the value. They also store, and it depends on the database engine, a record identifier. Depending on the engine you're using, it could be, a lot of them use a hexadecimal address that you can never see. It basically says in the table, 
it's in this address and it's literally a memory map saying, you know, this is where the, all the Fs are in this table. Uh, Oracle stores an actual real physical address on the disk. It says this record is found in this sector. And it goes reads the sector off the disk. Uh, Sybase does the same thing. I'm assuming IBM DB2 also because they're kind of, you know, in the same, uh, they play in the same uh, range of uh, SQL. I have no idea what it does. Cause some, most of the time it works and sometimes it doesn't, but that's my SQL. So you have unique indexes. Normally it's only for primary keys because what do you never want in a table? A duplicate primary key. So if you make it a unique index, not only does it speed up the searches, it doesn't let you put in a duplicate value. You can also use it for other fields that you want to have. Um, for example, you've got an e-commerce site and people log in using their email address. Do you want to let two different people use the same email address? No. You might want to create a unique index on the email address. That way, if the programmer sucks and doesn't catch at registration time, you can make sure that they don't screw up your database. Um, you also have non-unique indexes. These are secondary indexes. Usually they're done for fields that are often, often grouped together um, to search for individual entities. Um, sometimes it's one column, could be a combination of columns. And the SQL syntax create them is create a unique index, give it a name, on, table name, parentheses, column. Or you know, combination of columns. Uh, if you don't want it to be unique, you just drop the key, unique keyword. So it's create index, whatever it's called, on product description. All right, so a few rules for using indexes. You want to use them on larger tables. The primary key is always indexed. So you want to index what, what's called search fields, fields that are commonly used in a where clause. If we're talking about a customer database, you're probably going to index phone numbers, email address, postal code, potentially. Um, you know, usually street address, you wouldn't, you know, maybe the city, depending if you're running a lot of metrics and you're searching by region. Um, maybe you search by more than one field regularly, so you'd create compound index. Um, any fields you tend to sort by, so anything in order by or group by clauses, you'll probably want to index those too because it'll make that process go faster. Um, normally, you want to, and this one is a little questionable. Um, I taught first taught this class 10 years ago, and this particular slide had these exact values. Um, really, there's more than 100 values. I'd say if there's more than a thousand values, um, computers are way faster than they were 10 years ago. And since I inherited those slides, this probably the contest didn't change for 10 years before that. Uh, so, but you definitely don't index on lower field counts, like lookup tables. I might only have five or six values in it. Like don't even bother index anything in those because there's no value. Uh, you're just adding extra structure to be maintained. Um, but yeah, like if you got lots of values, you index. So avoid indexes for fields with long values. By long values, we're talking about fields. You know, I like a VARCAR 1000 or VARCAR 5000. VARCAR 255, knock yourself out, index that if you want. But anything like that's chunky, you don't want to index. Why? I'll explain in a minute. But there's there's risks to indexing things that are too fat. Um, if the, the key to index is used to determine the location of record, use the surrogate key as much as possible. Um, it helps allow an even spread in the index because as part of the maintenance uh, that you do regularly on a database server is you want to update the indexes or maintain the indexes because they get out of date. Um, how many of you have used an index feature in a Word document? Nobody here's written a Word document long enough to make it worth having an index, eh? Okay. So let's say you use the indexing feature 
in a Word doc. And by the way, if you've never done it, you really should explore those features. They're nifty. It bases it on the heading settings. So heading one, heading two, heading three, it'll actually create the index based on those headings. So you've got an index or table of contents, same difference. And you've got values in there. And you've they've edited the document so the page numbers have changed, but the, the thing has not updated. You have to update the table of contents or the index so that it redetermines what the right pages are in the document to display. Indexes get dirty. Therefore, if you're using a numeric index, a numeric key, it makes the rebuild a lot faster than if you're having to deal with alphanumerics. Um, some database servers may have a limit of number of indexes per table, or even the number of bytes per table. Uh, I haven't seen that in a long, long time. Uh, there once was a time, and you never know where you're going to go work. You might go end up working somewhere that has archaic systems running in the background buying layers and layers of firewall security because they can't patch it and they can't turn it off. Just be aware that there might be limits. Um, the other thing you should avoid indexing is columns that may have a null. So columns that are optional probably should not be indexed because what happens is if you have a column with a null that is indexed, and then you include that in the where clause, but one of the other components of the where clause might be valid, it will ignore those rows that have nulls. It's as if if there's an index and the column has a null, it's as if it doesn't exist as far as the index is concerned. So don't index things with nulls because they become invisible to the query parser. Okay, so I am going to put out a, a couple of other little caveats about indexes before I get into some more syntax. Um, Indexes are cool, they make things go fast. We've established that. However, indexes have a risk. And I just want to make sure I cover this. I might have it in a later slide, or at least a point where I usually talk about it, but I'm thinking about it now, so I don't want to forget it. Indexes is a double-edged sword. I've had cases where um, A, a database wasn't indexed enough, it performed like crap. I had another database where it was indexed too much, and it performed even worse. Here's why. There's a couple of different risks with indexes. Risk number one, you've decided to create an index of every column and then a combination of almost every other column just to be, just to catch every possible where clause. The query optimizer, which is something that is not taught in college, uh, I think that's like a third or fourth year university type course, it receives the SQL command. It reads the SQL command. It then figures out the best possible way to give you the fastest results. So it goes, oh, they're selecting from table A and table B. Fantastic. Huh. Table A has like 40 indexes. Let's look at the where clauses. Oh, none of these, none of the combination of the columns actually match any of my indexes. Table scan. Oh, there's three indexes that match the criteria. Eh, I don't know which one to use. Table scan. If the query optimizer is not sure what it's going to do, it's going to default to the safe solution, which is a table scan. Table scans are slow. Danger number two of indexes. I.O. performance. Now, we all have fancy SSDs. Great. Uh, in data centers, a lot of database servers are actually on a RAID array with good old platter disks with a cached RAID in front of it, but there's still performance issues when it's one of those. Every single time you update a record, it has to update the corresponding indexes. So you add a new record. There's six indexes. It's going to write the record. Then it goes, are there any indexes? Okay, yes. R read index one. Find where it's supposed to be index. Write the index back down. Is there another index? Three, four, five. So um, I want to actually talk to someone. They gave me a rough number. I don't remember exactly what it was. But for every index, you're adding seven disk operations. So you're adding one row. For every index, you're adding seven operations, except for the primary key. That one's kind of handled magically. But every other you know, B-tree index is handled. There's seven I-O operations. Read, read, verify, write. Verify they got written, and there's a couple of things in between. 
times 10 indexes. So in the meantime, while it's writing out that one row, everything else is waiting. So then you got another one that needs to be written. Everything is waiting again. So you're adding artificial slowdowns because it's writing in a bunch of different indexes. Now, good database servers can handle lots of indexes. I'm not saying you don't go and do it, just don't overdo it. Um, and this last risk also dates back to uh, when drives were a lot smaller than they are now. And one of the things people don't think about is how much disk space actually costs. And I'm really I'm finding it very entertaining where I'm working now compared to where I was working before because we nickel and dimed every ounce of disk space we had. This new place is like, it's on a sand. It's got like 50 terabytes of space. We don't care. Just do it. Right? And I'm like, yeah, no. Somebody has to maintain those disks. They take up room. You know, they cost money. Uh, my tax dollars. And back in the day, drives were a lot smaller. So let's say we had a table with 10,000 rows. Table is occupying one megabyte. Okay. And we had 10 indexes. Each index was occupying 200K. Doesn't sound like much because I'm using smaller numbers, but it's 200K times 10. So then we got two megabytes of indexes for one megabyte of data. Now let's pretend instead of being a one megabyte table, it's a one gigabyte table. And our indexes are now taking up two gigabytes. That one table is occupying three gigs of disk space. Still by today's computers, people are like, yeah, did you see Modern Warfare? You know, hundred what was it, 140 gig download? Huge games. In a data center, you care about that disk space because it costs money. Um, those are the risks of indexes. Is uh, confusing the query parser, disk operations, using up too much disk space. Uh, one makes everything slow. Second one makes everything slow. The third one costs you money. And I guarantee the management cares the most about the third one. The first two slow down people, and people are expensive too. Right, so if the application is slow because your your database is slow, so indexes make things fast until it's too confusing. All right, syntax: create index, whatever it's called, on table field name. You can create a multi-column index by putting in a comma delimited list of columns. Please note: an index can only ever be created on one table. You can't create a multi-table index. So when I was talking earlier about creating X on a foreign key, it literally is on, you know, you got order and order lines. In order lines, you got an order ID column. You create the index on order ID and, and order lines, and that will perform, improve the, the speed of the joins. You're indexing the same data twice, but in two different places. So a multi-column index would help, for example, Select star from person where age is equal to 55 and city is equal to Seattle. It would speed that up, but it would not help the second example. Select star from person where city is equal to Seattle because city equals Seattle does not match a known index. Person is an index and it's two columns. The query optimizer will say, do we have any indexes that's just city? No. Done. Table scan. Which is why newbies tend to over index a lot because they're like, oh, I never know what combination of columns I'll ever need. So let's start doing all the combinations I can think of instead of, you know, watching performance metrics and engaging with their users to find out what's actually used. Um, so, yeah, so that's one of the things about indexes. So, Indexes on number ranges, like create index, age index on a person's age, would help um, with the range because it knows where those records would be in that range. It'll speed up the, the collation of the records. And there's the question that I couldn't remember if it was in the slides. Was, why not create indexes on everything? I think I explained that pretty well. Bruh. Okay. I really wish I could show you guys 
my old work environment where I could pull up the AWS database performance insights so I could show you guys what improves indexes. I can still get into it, but I should get into it. They, they kind of forgot to turn off my AWS access. It's nice. So <clears throat> topic number two for the day, views. All right. So did you get did they talk to you guys about views last semester at all? Oh great. I don't need to do the rest of these slides. I'm kidding. I actually did you guys probably created views and stuff. I should really ask these questions at the start of the term. Um so views are relations, except they're not physically stored. Um it's for presenting different information to different users. So we've got a table called employee with a social security number, name, department, project, and salary. We can, in theory, create a view that limits which records are being pulled out and how much of each record is being seen. So create view developers as, and then the query to define it. So a payroll department would have access to the entire employees, but some might only see the developers. It means we can control what the developers see in the view and confidential information is protected. Uh, that's one of the more common uses for it, where depending on a person's user access level, it actually changes the table using the query so that certain fields are not pulled up. Um, it's not necessarily the best way to do it anymore, the way applications are written nowadays, uh, but it was a very common way of uh, doing it. Um, way back when I first started in Ottawa, um, I worked for digital equipment, which became Compaq and then HP. We, uh, one of our divisions, well, I worked at the call center, not as a tech, but as a software developer. One of our divisions was using a piece of software called Remedy for their call tracking system. Remedy was really nifty. It was really not just a call tracking system. It was actually an application development environment where you could just add columns. But anyway, the cool thing was it would create tables for each of these columns and then view to connect everything. Um, it was slow as dog shit. But, you know, the fact that you could not, you didn't need to know how to program to program it was really cool. Uh, you really needed to know what you were doing when you were developing for it. Um, one of the things they did was they could use view to normalize the content being pulled out so that you want to pull up a ticket or something out of the customer tracking or whatever. It would always guarantee that certain fields were there using the view, and then the view would also add on any of the extra stuff so that the UI would be receiving it as expected. Um, so how do you create a view in MySQL? Create view, give it a name as your select statement. Now, in MySQL, views are always dynamic views. There's actually two kinds of views, and I'm pretty sure I'm gonna talk about the second type in a minute. But in MySQL, please note that views are always dynamic. It means they're always up to date. Every time you request records from the view, it runs the underlying query. All right, so we want to pull, um, we got a table called person with name and city, purchaser, purchase, I mean, which would be buyer, seller, product, and store, product with name, maker, and category. And we could have a view that says create view, Seattle view as. And then we're actually doing a join. We've got a where clause in our view. It would create what's called a virtual table. And it would be called basically Seattle view. And it would return buyer, seller, product, and store. Um, as far as the query parser is concerned, that view is a table. It looks like a table. It smells like a table. It acts like a table, kind of, but it's not a table because it doesn't actually exist. The definition exists, but the actual table itself does not. The closest example I can think of for you guys that you're comfortable with, and my database prof in college would hate me for saying this, it's like a bookmark in your browser. 
You know, you can take a really long URL and then give yourself like a nice little shortcut in your browser and you click on that and it brings you a nice big long URL. That shortcut, that, that link in your browser that, you know, you got in your toolbar and your favorites, whatever, it's not the web page. It just points to where the web page is. And a view does the same, something similar. It has a name, just like your bookmark has a name, and it has the definition of where to go get the data. The view has a definition of how to retrieve the data. So, not even. It, imagine it's a class on top of a class. It's, a, it's inheriting three other classes. Yeah, it's the other way around. So it basically gives you uh, a nice way of hiding complex queries. Um, and then in theory, we could use the view. Select name store from Seattle view comma product and do a join. So what's cool is the view looks like a table. You can use it in joins. It actually respects the underlying indexes. So it figures out performance connections like it should. Um, but the whole structure is not there. So what happens when we query the view? Since the view is not a true table, it doesn't actually contain the data. It reaches in, looks at the definition, runs the internal query, creates a table in memory. And if there's more things being done to it, then it applies it to that virtual table. Um, if you need to change the data, you don't do it in the view, you do it at the table. So with regular insert, update, deletes. So that previous example I had with the view being used in a join, or that's not even in a, in a join, it's, um, yeah, it is in a join. It basically takes the, the original query we had, figures out how to bolt on the extra stuff that we just added on. So the original query might have had um, person and product or person and purchase, and it will build it all up and make it basically take two queries, merge them together and run them. Um, it's really cool the way it works, uh, I have to say. Um, it's, is what's being pulled out of the view. Everything in black is what was not in the view. And since Seattle view already had a name in it, it's actually grabbing the name from the view. Um, it's kind of cool the way it works. Okay, this is the important thing. Look, really knowing what it does on the inside is not that important. You just need to know how to create them and use them. The fact that, and not all database servers um, what's the word I'm looking for? Expand it. Some will create a virtual table in memory, use that to do all the work. Others will actually expand, merge the two queries together like this does. MySQL merges the queries. Postgres and Oracle, they create a virtual table in memory and use that to operate against. It takes The view puts it in memory and then does the rest against it. So different engines do things slightly differently. So that's why it's not that important. You just need to know that it works. Okay, so. There's two types of views. A virtual views are also known as dynamic views. Obviously, they're used in databases. Um, they're computed on demand. Also, there, in other words, you create a view, you select whatever from the view, it figures out the, what's supposed to be in the records at that point. And what does that mean? It's going to be a little bit slower because it actually has to run the query. The normal, the performance of you running the query as is, running take the same amount of time. What's good about it is always up to date. And then we have the other kind of view, a materialized view. MySQL does not support materialized views. Last I heard. Maybe they added an 8.0.32 versus 8.0.30. They're adding major features in like point releases. Um, so Materialized views, they're usually used in data warehousing. Uh, they're pre-computed offline, so that means they're way faster. It doesn't need to think about it because the data has already been figured out. But the problem with materialized views is it may have stale data. Now, dynamic views, you guys, 
you played with them last semester, so you have a rough idea what they do. Materialized views is used for uh, big data. So, for example, Amazon. They collect their data through the day. They normalize it. And update their um, materialized views. So that a person can go look at, I don't know if anybody here has ever sold things through Amazon. You know, we've all bought things through Amazon, but most people, I don't think I've only had one student in the last four years say, hey, I've actually sold stuff through Amazon. Um, you can rarely see up-to-date data about your sales. You can see up till yesterday. So what it does is it refreshes the materialized views every night of the daily sales the monthly sales, the whatever number it falls. Um, it's fantastic for um, dashboards. That I can give you guys an example of. Hopefully they haven't broken this website. And let's see if they've killed my account. They have not. See the sales dashboard? how fast that loaded let me let me do a refresh for you guys okay that contains data going back to 2012 that database and you know you can see charts and they show the sales you know time over to over years uh period year to year stuff like that um all of these are materialized views none of this data is important that it needs to be up to date we're comparing the numbers of, you know, 2013, 14, and we're in 2024. Who cares? That numbers aren't changing. So you have materialized views that it is stored. It's ready to be reported on. It doesn't need to do any joins. The data is static. That's the power of a materialized view. The other problem, though, is it might have stale data. Yes. Yeah, well, that's exactly what it is. It's a table, but it's a table that's a view. So you can't insert, update, and delete into a materialized view. You can only refresh it. Um, and so you need to learn about how, how to refresh them because MySQL doesn't support it. Yay. Um, so, which leads me into, it might have stale. The materialized view will only have, have the data that was there when the view was created or refreshed. You can refresh the view. So you go in and you run a command and it says, hey, materialized view, your data is out of date. Refresh yourself now. So it runs the query, cleans out the table, puts everything in. Database servers have all the commands to do that built in. MySQL does not. You can mimic this with MySQL. Can anybody think of how you'd mimic this behavior in MySQL? You make a table. And then when you want to refresh the contents of your table, you truncate the table and you do an insert select from that. So you actually have to write code so that it knows what to insert into that table. Whereas if you have a materialized view, You've defined it once, and you just go, um, It's I think it's literally uh, refresh materialized view, and you give it the name, and poop, it just does it for you. So it's one line as opposed to, you know, three, four, five lines of SQL to make sure everything's good. But that's exactly how you mimic it in MySQL. You can do it. It's just not very nice. Okay. So. How can you add a row into a table that doesn't exist? So we've got a table called um, employee has a social security number, name, department, project, and salary. And the social security number happens to be our primary key. So if we go insert into developers, values, Joe, comma, optimizer, what's going to happen is in the background, it'll create a new query called insert into employee. You will notice that there's nulls in each of the columns that aren't part of the view. And if our social security numbers are primary key, and now we're trying to feed a null into the primary key, 
How well do you think this is going to go? It's not going to work. It will cause an error. Now, there's ways of creating um, views. And I, these slides are out of, out of order. That's fun. All right. Now I'm going to finish talking about the other issue first, and I'll get back to this. Um, if you want to make a view where you can insert, update, and delete the data in the view, you have to include the primary keys of every table involved in the view. So if there's a join, there's three tables, you're going to be including the primary keys and the foreign keys for all three tables. At that point, you're basically defeating the point of having a view because you're just pulling extra stuff along for the ride. Uh, it's kind of pointless. Um, I'm pretty sure I got a slide for that towards the end. Um, so there are a few ways of updating views, though, if you want to talk about changing the structure. Um, so the command below um, will set a view. What the heck's this slide saying? I even read this before I came in today, and it made sense when I was doing it at home. All right. So what this slide's talking about, now that I've reread it, that's why you shouldn't read it while you're in a meeting. Um, completely honest. So the first command on here is showing how to view, like how to update the, const the structure of the view. The second one is talking about updating a value in the view. The update will not work because you don't have the primary key. The first one is create or replace. Um, so when you create or replace a view and you give it a name and you give it the structure, there's a few gotchas with it. Um, the first gotcha is to replace the view, it has to have returned the same number of columns. So you can update the from, you can update the where, but the select part has to stay the same. The number of columns and their data types have to stay the same. So if column one is an integer and column two is a, a varcar, when you change it, it has to be an integer and a varcar being returned. Um, if you want to change the number of columns, add columns, change the order, whatever, you actually have to drop it and recreate it. Um, that's why the replace view is not that useful, because most of the time when you're changing a view, you're at, you're changing the table, the columns coming back, not just tweaking the where clause. Um, but you know, you can always try to replace it. Okay, so it, here's a link, and but this won't be on the test, so don't even worry about it. Um, there's a link here that tells you how to actually do that is updatable for MySQL. Um, so if we were trying to add something to this view, it's going to fail because, well, we, we're not feeding it the primary keys. If you want to drop a view in MySQL, it's literally drop if exists view name. I don't know if you guys have learned about if exists. Um, if exists is handy. It will try to do the drop command. And if it doesn't exist, it pretends it never even asked. It's like saying, hey, I want to open the door, but first you check and see if there's a door there. OK, that's the views. Um, there's really not that much more to a view. You create the view and you use it. Um, there's a bit of logic happening behind the scenes. And there's just the two kinds. All right. Now, before I get to the example of the normalization that I didn't do last week, because, well, my health was going downhill for a few days, um, I'm just going to bring up the midterm, because some of you might care. It's funny, I don't know who's paying attention. I say midterm, and everybody says, we're like, boop. I just should throw in the word midterm at random in my lecture. Yeah. For what, creating a view? Oh, the create an index. It's literally the same syntax that was in the slides. Sure. Well, MySQL decides to launch because my. It creates a, it creates a, a like a basically a, a table name that points to the query. Like the table's there, it's not a real table. 
It's just, it's like a label. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's permanent. It's it's there. The index is there. The view is there. It's there permanently until you drop it. Yeah, yeah. It's part of the database structure. Okay, so um, so I've got a table here called airlines. The index is well, the primary key is index. Let's say I want to index the ICAO. So I could go create index. Actually. And that's the syntax to create the index. That's it. So if I were to run it, assuming I got it right, it'll tell you how many rows were affected. And if I go to my tables and I look at airlines and I go refresh, there's my new index I just created. But that's it. That's all there is to the index. Now it's going to get used. So if I were to go It'll use the index in that query. There's really nothing more to it. That pretty much covers. No. Index is part of the table. It's not a table. The index is a structure that helps the query optimizer know how to pull the data out. You can't select from it. You can't look at it. You can't see what's in it. It's a black box, but you can do select star from a view, which I think I do have a view in this database. You can't do it. You can't. You can do. You do select star from the view. You can't do select star from index. The index. So we think about it as a book. You want to find um, something in the book. You look at the index, which is part of the book. You can't go, show me all the indexes. Well, you're sending the library and all the books are there. You can't look at the indexes because they're part of each book. You physically cannot see the contents of the index. It is physically impossible. Yes, you can, if you want. You can open up a binary edit, a hex editor, and open up a file on your disk and look through it that way. But you cannot look at the contents of the index. There's no way for you to look at what's inside the index. It's literally binary data. It's going to be noise to you. Um, when your queries are slow. That's part of the design process as people start testing and using it. They'll just say, hey, I'm trying to pull up this customer record. It's really, really slow. And you discover that the fact that it's pulling up the orders, but there's no index on, say, the customer ID in the order table, that's what's making it slow. So then you'd go index the customer ID. You would look at which you talk to your users and say, hey, which way do you search the most? Oh, I search the most by phone number. Then you'd index the phone number. There's no way to know the day you create the database exactly how you need all your indexes to be done. Yeah, stay away from the word view. The index and view are two different things. The index is for optimization. Views are for basically looking at the data. Indexes for speed, a view is just a different way of looking at it. Yeah, that's literally that. It's a bookmark. 
It's like a bookmark. It stores the definition of a query for further use. It has nothing to do with performance. Indexes have to do with performance. Indexes make the database go faster. The view just lets you change how you look at the database. One's how you look at things. One is how fast you find it. You can't create an index on a view. You can create an index on the table. The, the view will use the index from the table that it refers to. But the view knows nothing about the index itself. OK? You, know, you index the columns that need to be act, that are used the most often for searches. Primary key is always used. Depends if it's a if it's a product table, maybe you'll the SKU or the description of the product. If it's a customer table, the phone number and their names. Maybe a combination of the two. Who knows? It depends on what the database is supposed to do. Some tables will only ever have one index. Some might have four or five. It, it's basically based on the usage of the database and what what uses it up the most. And how do you do that? Performance profiling, user feedback. Uh, investigating, you know, performance testing at the beginning by beginning by loading it full of fake data and running all your common queries to see which ones are slow. Okay, now back to the midterm, which that's where everybody's head went up. Now they all went back up again. Um, the midterm, it's going to be before the break. Um, hang on, calendar. It'll be on the twentieth, so next week in two weeks, not next week. Two weeks um, in this room at four o'clock. It is multiple guests with Scantron. It used to be online, but we're not, I'm not allowed to do. We're not allowed to do online. Our chair has decided there's no such thing as online tests anymore. Um, it used to be in Brightspace, which made my life way faster. Um, so it covers weeks one to five. So technically, you've got all the material for the midterm. Um, if it's not in the slides or not in the, that recommended reading, it's not on the test. Which follows up, no, there's no practical test. So there's no lab test. Like, how am I supposed to do a lab test on, hey, I want you to normalize and diagram this. Some people are suffering trying to get through one lab. Imagine trying to do like all four labs as one test. There's no way. Considering most of the labs are fairly simple examples to start with. So there is no practical assessment. There's no SBA. Yay. So you're going to come in here on the 20th, sit down with your HB pencil, a really good eraser, some tissues for your tears. Um, I'm kidding. It's not that bad. Um, and it's, uh, oh boy, 40 questions, if I remember off the top of my head. I'll actually go through it in detail next week. Um, 40 questions, multiple choice, only one correct answer per question. By now, you guys must have done at least one Scantron test. Must have experienced it by now. So I don't need to explain to you about how to fill in your bubbles properly. I hope not. But I will have some pro tips for you guys that you might not know about how Scantron works, because I happen to know how it works on the inside. Um, so next week, I'll be having a review. It's going to be a really quick class, like literally like half an hour, and we all get to go home. Um, I'm just going to cover quickly what's over, because I don't do a comprehensive review. Um, why? One, I record my lectures. Two. I remember being a college student, having my profs try to cover five or six weeks worth of material in 45 minutes to an hour. I don't know if you guys have experienced that yet, where you have a prof that insists going through 150 slides in, you know, an hour and say, this is going to be on the midterm. They go flick, 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 flick. And they go, this is important. That's not important. This is important. That's not important. They're flicking through and you're like, brains leaking out your ears. Yeah, I don't do that. I literally give you the highlights of what's on the test. 
and what you should focus the study on. Okay, now, now to do the normalization. All right, here's my uh, my little data table. Let's make this a little fatter. A little more complex than the last one I did. Um, so we've got basically a library. Oh, by the way, this is the one I asked, uh, you know, Microsoft Copilot to generate me an example for me. So I haven't tried to solve this yet, so I don't even know if it can be solved. But we're going to assume that it can be uh, because it gave you a solution. <laughs> but I didn't look at it. Because I didn't want to look at it because I want to go through it with you guys. Okay. So we've got ourselves a table of data and a bunch of columns. And I'm going to write them out on the board. And we're going to go unnormalized first. And man, this broom is brutal. I can't see the screens when I stand to the front. I can't see what's on that screen. Okay. We've got uh, book ID, book title, oh, hey, yeah, you read it out to me, author ID, author name, Genre ID, genre name, right? Okay. Okay, I'm going to simplify that one to just B because I'm running out of room. Okay, borrow name. B name. B date. Return date. Is that the last one? Okay, so this is unnormalized. And of course, my writing is getting smaller as I go to the right because I realized I was running out of room. So right now it's unnormalized. What does that mean? It means that, well, we do have to find a primary key. The good news is we don't have repeating groups of columns in this because they're pre-populated. Um, theoretically, I could have, but I did not. Um, so we need to look at our data and see which columns we can use to uniquely identify any given row. Okay, we got book ID and, yeah. So the combination of book ID and borrow ID lets us find any given row. Those are the two columns that are always unique. So we are suddenly gonna go from unnormalized because I don't wanna rewrite that entire thing right away to first normal form by squeaky marker. That's our primary key. With that combination of columns, we can find any of the rows in that table of data we have. So the first thing we want to do is find our Full dependencies. Okay, so when we look at this table and we look at the data, we can look at the combination of the we want to find the full dependency first. So we look at book ID and borrow ID, and we go at when we look at this, we go, okay, which ones, which fields depend completely on the entire primary key? All right. Book title, is that, really? All right, book title, does that depend on the entire primary key? No. Author ID? Author name? Genre, genre ID, okay, we're gonna say no to these two. Skip this, the borrow's name? No. The borrow date and the return date. So we know that these two depend on the entire key. So now we know what our you know full dependency is, and I forgot one line right here, like that. 
So now we're going to look for our partial dependencies. All right, so book title depends only on the book ID. Author ID depends only on the book ID in this case, right? We can actually go around with the genre also, and we can say, okay, this is a partial dependency going here. Now, before I've got somebody that chirps up and says, hey, but what about author name depends on author ID, and then author ID depends on the primary key. This is a transitive dependency. We deal with that later. Because author ID is not part of the primary key, we don't care about the other stuff right now. We just worry about what depends on part of the primary key. And then if we come over here, we've got the book name depends on the book ID. And that's, uh, sorry, the borrow ID. The borrow name depends on the borrow ID. All right. So now we've identified, so how many sets of lines do I have on here? Three. That means I'm going to have how many entities in second normal form? Three. So now we're going to do 2NF. We're going to create an And book has book ID, book title, author ID, author name, genre ID. Genre name. We will have borrower. Which will have the borrower ID. I don't need to make it short anymore because I'm not running out of room. And the borrower name. And our Last one we'll call it uh, lend, for lack of a better word. And it has the book ID and the book. Uh, no, that's not right. The book ID, I was just repeating the first part again. Uh, the borrower ID. The borrow date and the return date. Okay, that's our table. And we're gonna do our primary keys like this, like this, like that. And since those are foreign keys, I'm just gonna highlight them a second time, just like that. Okay, so this is second normal form. We no longer have any partial dependencies. Basically, every column depends on the primary key. But we do have a problem, and that problem is the transitive dependencies. And there is one specific table that has a lot of transitive dependencies, the book table. So. For everybody's refresher, a transitive dependency is when one attribute is defined by another attribute that is not part of the primary key. And our transitives are author ID and genre ID. So this is saying that the author name is defined by the author ID. But because author ID is not part of the primary key, it is a transitive dependency. It is data we could take out of this table and put elsewhere to make it easier to maintain. Because even though these two are in 3NF already, this one is not. Because if we wanted to update an author's name, we'd have to do it in multiple places. If we want to change the genre 
the description of genre from uh, horror to thriller, we'd have to do it in multiple places. Therefore, we don't want to do that. We want to have it as its own entity. So we need to break it out into its own pieces. And I am going to just going to do it up here. So I'm going to erase the first part up here. And um, go ahead. There you go. Here's your chance to take a picture. Show off your uh, your fancy cameras. The, the the iPhones versus the Samsungs versus the Xiaomi's. Hey, take a picture of the moon. This is being recorded also, and you could also grab screenshots from the screen recording. <laughs> okay. Uh, one more. Okay. All right. So we now have two colored lines. That means we have two more entities to create. Uh, the first table we're going to create is called author. And this will have author ID, author name, which at this point we can get rid of the author name out of this table, but we leave the author ID behind. Which me doing it like this actually gives you guys the visual of what actually happens to the to the fields, and the last one will be genre, which has the genre ID and the genre name, and again over here we get rid of that bit. And we have this left behind. I'm not. I'm just going to consolidate this so it's a little nicer looking. So, genre ID. Close off the table like this. And I need these two markers because this is a primary key. This is a primary key. And. I, these two are foreign keys. So we went, we go from that table structure to this table structure. So we went from one table of data into five tables of data. But what's cool is now, if we need to change the description of an author's name, because somebody made a typo, we can fix it. We only need to do it in one place. Um, same thing for the genre. We want to add a new genre. We don't need to create a new book to add the genre because we can just add a new genre. Um, you know, we want to add a new borrower. We can just add a new borrower to the database. We need to change a borrower's name because that does happen. We can do it in one place that has affect their history. Yep. Just jumping straight to the end. Okay, so to be completely honest, I rarely go through the steps because I've been doing it for 26 years, right? One of the advantages when you're first starting out is you go through the steps. So you're eliminating one problem at a time. You know, when you start doing something for the first time, you tend to do it step by step by step. Why? You want to make sure each step is done right. That's the that's why you do it step by step. Realistically, 
this is the end result we want. Who cares how we got there? Except when you're first starting out. I've had students try to jump to the end. And I used to not, you know, for, I, just, I used to say, show me your normalization. And they just give me the end result that was wrong. Now I make them show me the steps because it forced them. It's a bit like math, right? You know, for certain kinds of math, and my math skills aren't there, so I can't uh, really even say what kind of math it is. Um, I know the CT and the CP students, their first math course, for example, that they have, has um, a lot of the work they do has two ways to solve it. The formal way and the fast way. And they're required to do it the formal way because it shows every step of the work without any shortcuts. You can do the fast way, which has shortcuts to skip certain steps, but it still gives you the same result. Theoretically, with normalization, you can skip steps if you're good enough at realizing the data. But the problem is that even when I skip steps, like I go and look at the data and go, okay, it's broken down like this. I'll take at my results and then I'll start looking at each of these and start looking at it in first, second, or third normal form. Do I need to know? Am I finding any partial dependencies? Am I finding any transitive dependencies? So I'll do an initial breakdown and I'll still go through table by table. And sometimes, and I'll be completely honest, it's actually come back to bite me in the ass because it actually took me longer because I took a shortcut at the beginning than if I did it the right way from the, right from the start. Because I got to the end, I'm like, something's not right. And I had to rewind everything I did and redo it. And then I still did it the fast way and it was wrong the second time too. I am not so proud to not be able to admit I screw up. So I tend to be a little more careful nowadays, but at a glance, like this structure here is simple. At a glance, I'd be able to tell you what the pieces are. It's fairly obvious, especially considering what the column names are called. I made, when this example was generated, it was generated to make it as a learning exercise. So it was obvious what the pieces were. If you're working with, um, I used to have this data set during COVID that I was using as examples. Uh, they were actually publishing the entire data sets. Health Canada was publishing all the data sets for COVID. And you could actually pull down like, like per city, how many cases per city wastewater numbers, everything. And it was just like this disaster of a data set where you honestly had no idea what was related to what until you spent like an hour looking at the data. But it was a good example of, you know, why you need to do the normalization step by step because based on the column names, you had no way to actually guess what the relations were right off the bat. This one was simple. Um, it's, it's good for teaching normalization. It's actually, I have to say, Copilot did a good job generating this one. It covered all the important pieces and still made it clear on how it breaks out. Okay, so that was the example that I was supposed to do last week. Content is done for the midterm. I'll be doing a quick review next week, like half an hour, 40 minutes at most. Uh, midterm is in two weeks. Uh, lab four is due... This Friday, if I remember right. I'm not lying, am I? Lay on. I'd rather not be a liar. Because I've done that before. Yeah, so Lab 4 is due Friday. Lab 5 is due the week after. Um, lab 2 grades have been published. I ran into a student on Sunday morning while doing my groceries and they asked me if when the grades for lab two were going to come up. I just had to go home and hit the publish button because uh, they were graded. Um, lab three, I'm partially done grading them now. So usually I don't publish the results of the lab until the drop dead date has passed, which is, you know, seven days after the due date. Because then after seven days after the due date, you get a zero. But before that, you get a penalty. And I'd rather not publish the results so then they can just get a copy off someone else and just take the penalty and not do any work. Um, so, yeah, so I'll have uh, lab three grades should be coming up uh, Sunday, Monday, just so you know. Um, if you get lab five done and over with, technically, you should be able to do it this week now. Um, you have like zero work from this class for the break. 
Actually, technically, if you get everything done by next Friday like you're supposed to, as of the 20th, after that, like your midterm, you have nothing for this class. Think about it. Your labs are done and submitted. There's nothing. Those two lab periods are not. You're off. You're done. So, that being said, um, that's it for today, folks. I will see you uh, in lab or next week. Wait.